13 this morning. So Acts 25, 13. Hopefully you got that. 25, 13. So uh, let's, let's pray together before we start. Lord, now as we open your word, uh, we just pray that you would be uh, free to speak to each one of us. Help us to, to really have a heart to uh, just search out your truth in this passage, uh, a heart to hear from you so that we can obey you. Uh, and Lord, especially as we think about the idea this morning of our testimony, who we were before you saved us, how we were saved, and, and what it's like now that you've saved us. Lord, help us to evaluate uh, our heart. Help us to either uh, realize that we need to settle with you or be uh, convinced more than ever that we know you. Help us to reflect on uh, just our walk with you, uh, whether we are, are walking uh, in the, the fullness of what you have for us each day. Help us to evaluate whether we are eager to share with others about what you're doing in our life. And I pray that you will just protect this time, Lord. Help us to be able to hear clearly from you. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, last week, we, we studied the, the very significant phrase that Paul uttered, I appeal to Caesar. And that really changed the course of Paul's legal process because up until then, he had just kind of been shuffled from one judge to another, nobody willing to really say whether or not he was guilty or innocent. And so Paul finally says, I should be able to get justice. I'm standing in a Roman court. I appeal to Caesar. And so to that, in verse 12, uh, Festus replies, you've appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you will go. So this part of the story is kind of, a little bit of a, a weird part in the narrative because it seems like, okay, he, he appealed to Caesar. Well, he must be, you know, getting on a ship in the next verse to, to sail to Rome. But that's not what happens right after that. And so we're going we're gonna to read about that. Um, it's also the third time in Acts that Paul has given his testimony. And it's definitely one of those passages that you might say, well, we've read this twice already. This is going to be the third time. What can we learn by studying it a third time? Maybe we should just skip past that and uh, go to what's next. But, you know, uh, reading the third account of Paul's testimony was very meaningful, very encouraging. And uh, a part of it is on your bulletin, in, on, the, on the front of it. And uh, there's so much meaning in, in what seems like kind of a repetitive story. And it's not. And God put it there for a reason for us to learn from. So with that, uh, let's, let's begin reading this passage together. Acts 25, 13. Several days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea and paid a, a courtesy call on Festus. Since we were staying there several days, Festus presented Paul's case to the king, saying, There's a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews presented their case and asked that he be condemned. I answered them that it is not the Roman custom to give someone up before the accused faces the accusers and has an opportunity for a defense against the charges. So when they had assembled there, I did not delay. The next day I took my seat at the tribunal and ordered the man to be brought in. The accusers stood up and brought no charge against him of the evils I was expecting. Instead, they had some disagreements with him about their own religion. And about a certain Jesus, a dead man, Paul claimed to be alive. Since I was at a loss in a dispute over such things, I asked him if he wanted to go to Jerusalem and be tried there regarding these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held for trial by the emperor, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I could send him to Caesar. Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow you will hear him, he replied. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the auditorium with the military commanders and prominent men of the city. When Festus gave the command, Paul was brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all the men present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community has appealed to me concerning him, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he should not live any longer. I found that he had not done anything deserving of death, but when he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. 
Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after this examination is over, I might have something to write. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner without indicating the charges against him. Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. And so then this kind of begins Paul's defense. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, I am to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially since you are very knowledgeable about all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time. If they are willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand on trial because of the hope in what God promised to our ancestors. The promise our 12 tribes hope to reach as they earnestly serve him night and day. King Agrippa, I am being accused by the Jews because of this hope. Why do any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself was convinced that it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And I, I'm just going to pause as we read this and, and encourage you to notice that Paul is giving his testimony. And Paul describes how he was before Christ, the way that he opposed God. He describes his experience of being saved, and then he describes what it's like now that he follows Jesus. So, so pay attention to the before, the, how he was saved, and then the after as we read this. So in verse 10, I actually did this in Jerusalem. I locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme. Since I was terribly enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. I was traveling to Damascus under these circumstances with authority and with a commission from the chief priests. King Agrippa, while on the road at midday, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those traveling with me. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice speaking to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. I asked, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes so that they may turn from the darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to this heavenly vision. Instead, I preached to those in Damascus first, to those in Jerusalem, and in all the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and were trying to kill me. To this very day, I have had help from God, and I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing other than what the prophets and Moses said would take place, that the Messiah would suffer, and that, as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. We'll keep reading through the end of the chapter. Verse 24. As he was saying these things in his defense, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You're out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters, and I can speak boldly to him. For I'm convinced that none of these things have escaped his notice, since this was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Verse 28, Agrippa said to Paul, Are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? 
I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you, but all who listen to me today might become as I am, except for these chains. The king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with him got up. When they had left, they talked with each other and said, this man is not doing anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, this man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. That's a long passage. Hopefully you're still, still bearing with us here. So let's kind of set the stage for what's going on here. Uh, Paul had stood before Felix and then Festus. These were the governors of that region. It's also the same, uh, the same office as Pontius Pilate who tried Jesus, just to kind of uh, help, help set the stage of who we're talking about, the, the Roman governor of that region. So he, he stood before them. Uh, neither of them had been willing to reach a decision about him. And so he appealed to Caesar. So, but he's still staying uh, under custody while they get ready to send him to Rome. And in the meantime, this other guy, King Agrippa, comes to pay Festus a visit. Now, remember that Festus is new to his job. And so King Agrippa, it's a little bit confusing if you read the history of, of what exactly King Agrippa did. Uh, he, he kind of, as, as, as these uh, representative Jewish kings, kind of like a puppet ruler, really, under the Roman government, as they would gain favor with the Roman government, they would be awarded more territory. Uh, maybe as the, the circumstances in Rome changed, they would have some of their territory removed. But here he is, he's, he's the guy who's sort of the, the, the Jewish ruler. He, he, he's supposed to be a practicing Jew, although he really kind of sides more with the Roman government. But he's, he's a king in this region, and he's very knowledgeable, as Paul says, about all the ins and outs of the, the Jewish religion. So he comes to pay a visit to the new governor uh, in Caesarea. So that's what's going on, King Agrippa. Uh, this other lady, Bernice, or Bernice, uh, is, you, you would assume she was the queen. She's actually his sister, and they sort of uh, had a, you know, a dynamic of, of ruling together. But they arrive in Caesarea, and uh, so, so while, they're, while they're there, uh, Festus, it, it's kind of like you can picture him talking to this Jewish king and saying, hey, you know, there's this guy, Paul, and I really can't figure out what to do with him. Um, he appealed to Caesar, so I'm probably going to send him to Caesar, but I don't really even know what to say in the letter that I'm going to have to send with him of why I'm sending him instead of just making a decision myself. Uh, and, and it's almost like he kind of brings it up and, and maybe tries to capture Agrippa's interest so that Agrippa will say, oh, that sounds like an interesting case. Why don't we, why don't we examine him together? And uh, if that was Festus's intent, he was successful because then he says, okay, bring him here. I want to hear this guy. Uh, and so that's the, that's the occasion for this opportunity Paul has to talk to them. And, uh, you know, so they bring Paul in. Everybody comes in. It says in verse 23 that uh, all the military commanders and prominent men of the city come in. So it's kind of this big, big deal. And they bring Paul in, and he explains, yeah, I, I really kind of just don't know what to write to Caesar. Uh, if you were the governor and you were sending a prisoner to Rome, you wouldn't want to just send him haphazardly. Yeah, I don't know. Caesar, what do you think? That's not going to make Festus look good at all. Uh, he's not going to be promoted or rewarded if, if Caesar doesn't think that he's uh, doing his due diligence with uh, legal cases. Uh, I thought about uh, how, so, so in our house, and probably just our house, and nobody else's, uh, tattling can be an issue uh, with the children, mainly. Um, and uh, so, y you know, it it'll be the type of thing where uh, you kind of see the, the motives behind it. You know, they kind of want to put their siblings down, and maybe they'll, you know, get a little bit of a consequence or something, and they'll maybe gain some satisfaction out of that, and, you know, oh, great, yeah. They really got it. <laughs> so there, there, there's an issue with that in our house. And again, I'm sure that's just us. But uh, sometimes we'll say, well, you know, did you, did you talk to them about this? Like, uh, it seems like you're pretty quick to yell it out to us. But I mean, did you give them an opportunity to explain what's going on? Um, you know, maybe you could just, rather than you telling us and us telling them, you could just tell them directly. That would be a lot less work for everyone. Um, there's a, there's, there seems to be kind of an element of that where, 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 Festus doesn't want to just say, hey, Caesar, can you just figure this out? Can you just, you know, talk to this guy and figure that out? Caesar is the most powerful man in the world. You don't want to mess around with Caesar. So 
he's asking for help to, to, to frame the charges that he's going to send along with Paul to Rome. And so Paul is going to, again, share his, his testimony for the third time in Acts. A lot of times when something is repeated in the Bible, it's because God wants us to, to read it carefully and notice uh, the, the point of that story. I mean, certainly Paul's conversion is a very powerful story. You can also learn from what is included in this account that's not included in the other account. So, so that's an opportunity for us to say, well, why did God you know, uh, inspire Luke to write it out this way the third time and not the second time? Uh, that's a good way to study the Bible. So as Paul is, is telling this story, some of the parts he condenses, some of the parts he expands. But Paul is using a very similar strategy to what he's used several times when he's talking to a Jewish audience, which is he's basically saying, guys, I was a strict Jew. I'm a Pharisee. The whole point and the reason the Pharisees were founded is because they didn't think people were keeping the law strictly enough. And so they said, hey, we're getting lax in our our adherence to the law. We need to form this group called the Pharisees to make sure that people actually observe the strict Old Testament laws. That's, that's like the point of that group's existence. And so for Paul to say, I'm a Pharisee, means that he's identifying with a group of people whose whole thing is keeping the law strictly. That's what he's saying. I, I mean, I was that. Everything a Jew could be, I was, is, is kind of the point that he's making. And, and what he says is, I'm just doing what God literally appeared to me in a vision and told me to do. He's, he's saying it in a way that really they can't argue with. How could anybody argue with someone who is a strict follower of the law and is literally following a vision from God? You, you can't really criticize someone for doing that. That's Paul's argument. Uh, look, I mean, I was so mad at the church that I dragged them off to jail. I even tried to force them to deny Christ. That's how much I hated Christians and hated this man named Jesus. But it was only a vision from God who commanded me to change the way that I was living. So we're going we're gonna to dive into, starting in verse 16, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this message that God gives to Paul. And you have a, an insert in your bulletin. It's the same thing as, as the text. And so if it's helpful, you can look at that. If not, just, just read it in your own Bible. But there's several important things that God says to Paul. And... Um, I, I guess as I read this, as I, I thought about it, I was challenged to take this message that God sent to Paul and really uh, ask myself, ask all of us to evaluate whether we are fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. When he saved us, the, the purpose, the plan that he had, uh, are we fulfilling that? Am I fulfilling that? And so uh, look at what God says to Paul. Uh, he, he says, get up, stand on your feet. I have appeared to you. That's the first thing that's significant in this message that God sends to Paul. God appeared to Paul. Think about it. God, Paul was on his way opposing Jesus. He was on his way to arrest people who followed Christ. That's what he was doing when God appeared to him. It's like Romans 5.8 where it talks about while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And you might think about times in your life where you were absolutely opposed to everything God stands for or commands us to be, whether that was as a, as a lost person or even as a believer. I can think of times as a believer that I opposed everything I claimed to believe in the way that I was acting toward God. And, and I'm sure all of us can think of a time where we were opposed to God with our attitude, with our actions, with, with the condition of our heart, Uh, And and that's the moment where God appeared to Paul. I have appeared, Paul. God took the initiative and showed up in Paul's life for this purpose, to appoint you as two things. As a servant, Paul certainly talked about himself as a servant throughout his letters, a bond slave. Paul was totally sold out to doing everything God told him to do. We've talked about that as we studied Acts. Uh, Do we consider ourselves to be a servant of God? Uh, I don't, to be honest, I don't. Many times I think of myself as someone who is saved, who, who, you know, loves the Lord, wants to do good, wants to be rewarded at the end of my life. But I, but I add the caveat, but I, I'd like to enjoy everything my life has to offer in my flesh in the meantime. Uh, maybe you struggle with that too. Uh, God called him to be a servant, to be totally under the control of the will of God. 
and a witness of what he has seen and what he will see of God. And, and that phrase really just captured my attention as I read this because God had appeared to Paul in a vision, right? He was on the road to Damascus and he literally saw Jesus in a vision with his own eyes. So he's certainly seen a lot of God already when God makes this statement. He's seen Jesus Christ with his own eyes in a vision. That's, that's more than we've seen. But what he, he doesn't leave it there. He says, what you have seen and what you will see of me. And, and, and this speaks so much of our experience as Christians. Our, our testimony and, and what we speak about, what we are a witness of, isn't just that one time that we prayed a prayer and said, okay, I'd like to be saved, I want to go to heaven. That's not the end of our journey as Christians. Uh, I thought it was very interesting and maybe providential that we talked a lot about that in Sunday school this morning. Uh, and there were several good analogies of that, where uh, one of them was planting a garden. You don't just throw the seeds out in your garden, uh, talking about the moment of conversion. You don't just throw seeds out in the garden and say, great, I'm done for the year. I'm going to have a great harvest at the end of the season. No, it, it's a process, and th it takes effort to make those seeds turn into a plant that, that turns into fruit that you can harvest. And, and it's the same with our, our walk with God, where uh, what we are a witness of to the lost is not just that, hey, you know what, when I was in VBS, when I was five, I prayed this prayer, and yeah, I guess I'm uh, good now. It's not compelling. That's not much of, a, much of a testimony to the lost. What is a testimony to the lost is, do you know what God is doing in my life right now? Do you know what he did this week or this morning? Do you know something that just encouraged me so much as I read the Bible? Do you know what God did in my life that only could have been done by God. That's, that's our testimony. That's what we should be ready, uh, as the insert says in, in our bulletin, ready to give an answer of the hope that lies within us. Our, our walk with God is a day-to-day -day thing. It's not a one-time event that happened a long time ago. It's, it's an everyday journey that we should be prepared to give an answer for. So let's keep reading. Verse 17, I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles. Uh, we've certainly seen God do that for Paul. Uh, Paul even later says that God has fulfilled that promise. Now, in the second part of 17 and, and then all of verse 18, uh, here's, a, here's a picture of the gospel. Here is something that is, is God's desire for Paul, but it's also God's desire for us as Christians. This, this is what God called Paul to do. What, what did God pa call Paul to do? In the second half of verse 17, I'm sending you to them to... To open their eyes. What's the, what's the opposite of having your eyes open? It's blindness. That's a description of lostness throughout the Bible. Just It says, you know, the, the, the lost, they, they don't know what they're stumbling at. Uh, the, the people around us in our neighborhood, maybe in your neighborhood, at your workplace, maybe in family gatherings, people you see at the store, an accurate description of them, if they don't know Christ, is that they are blind. And not only blind, they are in darkness. And so, so God is sending Paul to the lost to open their eyes, to rescue them from darkness, and to free them from the power of Satan and, and bring them into the family of God. You know, in, in Romans 6, it says, you are a slave to whoever you willingly submit to obey. And uh, for the lost, it, it could even be the way that we're walking as a believer, but, but the lost for sure. They're blind, they're in darkness, and they're slaves to Satan. That, that is literally the status of their life. And it, it's good to remember that. It's good to, to think about, you know, those, those people that we meet when we're out and about. They're blind. They're in darkness that they can't get out of without Christ. They're under Satan's power. They're slaves to evil. And so the message of the gospel that Paul is defending before the, the Jewish king, but it's also what we need to defend as we live out our faith. The message of the gospel is hope, God's love for the lost. Uh, you know, when you talk to people about what, what Christianity is and what we believe, and 
oh, you know, you, you'll get a lot of answers. We, uh, we got several, you know, objections to the gospel this past week at the farmer's market where this guy kind of, you know, rattled off a list of the, the common objections. Well, you know, people have tampered with the Bible or, oh, well, you know, you hate women and, you know, these different things like that. Um, maybe it might be, you know, you hate people that have the certain lifestyle that's, that's immoral according to the Bible or you're just, you're just eager to tell me how bad I am. But those things are not, reflected in this message of hope of the gospel. God said to Paul, I love the lost, and I'm sending you to set them free from darkness, blindness, and being under the power of Satan. So for us, we should be confident that that is our message. The message that we proclaim, the, the reason that we gather here is because of God's great love for us. That's the defense that we have for existing as a church, for being Christians, God's love and mercy and compassion for the lost. And yes, it might mean some lifestyle changes as lost people come to Christ, but the message that we lead with is the message of how God loved them and sent his son to die for them. So I hope you're encouraged by that description of the gospel. So then he, he says to King Agrippa, so, so that's what I did. God appeared to me in a vision. I obeyed him, and now I'm here on trial. That's basically his defense. And the, the amazing thing about it is that this is Paul's testimony, that nobody, nobody can deny this. You'll see at the end of the story what, what they say in response to his testimony. If it's something that God has done in your life, it's a lot harder for someone to argue with. It's a lot harder for someone to say, well, you know, here's an objection on a logical basis of why that can't be true. If you've experienced it, it's pretty hard to, to deny. If you say, you know what? I have literally experienced God working in my life. I have seen his hand at work in a way that couldn't be explained any other way. That's pretty compelling. It's, it's much harder to deny that than to just go through a lot of, you know, logical arguments about why there is or isn't a God. And so our testimony is so powerful. Another description of the gospel in verse 23 He's saying, I, I'm just testifying what the prophet said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. And, and it's at this point that, that Festus jumps in. It's like, he can't handle it anymore. You're going crazy, Paul. This is, this is too much. I can't accept it. Uh, but then you see that, that, that Agrippa is a little bit more open to what he's saying. Uh, he, he kind of turns to Agrippa and says, hey, I know you understand the prophets, the whole basis for the gospel. So what is your answer, King Agrippa? He kind of, he, he puts it to them. Uh, he did this when he stood before Felix. And I, I'm just amazed at how Paul's the one that's supposed to be on trial. But actually, God is at work in these rulers' hearts. That's why God brought him there to testify to them. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Paul, you know, after Agrippa kind of tries to laugh it off, he says in verse 29, I wish before God that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you all, or not only you, but all who listen to me might become as I am, except for these chains. You could read this passage and you could think, well, it seems like it was a waste that he appealed to Caesar. Look, he said you could be set free if you hadn't, if you hadn't done that. Um, you know, so, so from a human standpoint, you could say, well, well, clearly God wasn't in control of Paul's life. He, look, he kind of allowed him to make this foolish choice as he's standing before Festus. Uh, wow, you know, that's what a shame. But it's not a mistake. It's a, it's a step in God's plan to take Paul, again, as we talked about last week, before the most powerful man in the world, to Caesar himself, to preach the message of the gospel. That was Paul's whole reason for doing everything that he did. And so there's, a, there's another reminder here for us that, that God doesn't do anything by accident. Nothing that, that happens to us that God allows is a mistake. Uh, we should be confident in this idea that God is working. I might not understand why these things are happening in my life, but God does. And so maybe you need another reminder this morning that if a circumstance you're in doesn't make sense or is a source of discouragement causing you to maybe doubt God as we are so prone to do, God doesn't do anything by accident. 
he has a purpose for each of us. Part of that is our testimony, doing things in our life to allow us to be able to say, look, I was struggling with this situation in my life. I, I would, one of these days, we'll have to get Ken uh, Dietzel to share his testimony because uh, he has a great story of how for most of his life, a lot of his adult life, he's had terrible health. And, and God is, is doing things in his life that, that are exciting to watch where he says, you know what? I can now say after going through that, that God is faithful. Uh, and, and being able to, to hear him say that is so powerful to the lost because, you know, he's not somebody who can, can claim that everything is easy for him. Uh, he, he's not someone that can say, look, you know, I became a Christian and everything's great now. I don't have any hardship. Uh, it's easy for me to follow God. That's, that's not his testimony. His testimony is that through a lot of suffering and difficulty and hardship, I have been able to find that God is faithful. Uh, and so in a, in a little bit, we're going to have a time where we write out our testimony that will be later in the service. But I, I would just encourage you to think about what has God done in your life? Um, what, what was it like before you followed God? How did you come to know the Lord? Do, do you know the answer to that question? Are you, are you certain that you have? And then after you get past that, asking ourselves, what is God doing in our life? What is the testimony that we have that we proclaim when the lost ask, hey, why, why do you go to church every week? Why are you a Christian? Um, what is, what's the point of that? To be able to say, I'm glad you asked because this is what God is doing in my life right now. Uh, would you like to hear what God has done recently, that he's taught me from his word, that he's encouraged me through circumstances with ways that I've seen him at work? I'd love to tell you about that. Uh, because I have a, a living, active, day-to-day -day testimony of God at work. Um, the, the issue, if, if, we, you know, if you or, or I don't have a good answer to that question, it's not God's fault. Uh, if, if, if we struggle to say, you know what, I don't, that's kind of been a long time since God's really done anything significant in my life. Uh, the issue is not with God. He's not uh, just kind of taking a break from working in our life. If, if it feels like maybe God isn't at work in your life or my life. The issue is that so often I and all of us are so busy and we, we just, we, we don't prioritize sitting at the feet of our Savior and saying, Lord, would you use me today? Would you, would you help me to be available to do your will? Lord, even if it doesn't make sense, I'm going to seek to follow you when you give me opportunities to speak about Christ, to minister to others. As we do those things, then God can say, great, I was waiting for you to be available for me to finally work through you. Uh, here's an opportunity to share the gospel. Here's an opportunity to minister to somebody. As we seek to be obedient, as we give God those windows to speak to us, then God can work in our life. And we will have a testimony. It's not a, it's not a question of whether if we're surrendered to God, um, you know, he, he may or may not choose to work through us. He, he wants to work through all of us to share the gospel, to give him glory. And uh, it's, it's a matter of really asking, are we, are we walking with God in such a way that he can work through us, uh, that we can have a testimony of how he's working in our life? So we're going to revisit that later in the service. But for now, let's pray. And we're going to spend some time asking God, Lord, Am I listening to you? Am I being obedient such that I have a testimony so that when the lost ask me, why do you believe that, that I'm, I'm ready, that I know why I believe what I believe? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you desire to work through each one of us, that even though we are so uh, flawed, we are so uh, imperfect, insignificant, uh, we don't have the ability, Lord, to do great things for you in our own strength. But we thank you that in spite of our sin, in spite of our weaknesses, in spite of our inadequacy, you desire to use each of us as a vessel for your kingdom. And so, Lord, I pray that you would be working in each of our lives. Now, Lord, I, I pray that we would give you the chance to speak to us, the chance to show us what your will is for where we can work and where we can give you glory. And I, I pray, Lord, that you would help each person here this morning to have an answer to the lost at any given point of why we believe what we believe. 
what you're doing in our lives, ways that we can give you glory by praising you through our testimony. Lord, I pray that you would get great glory by the testimonies of what you have done and will do in the lives of each person here. I pray that you would bring the lost to Christ. I pray that you would encourage us as we see you at work in each other's lives. And I pray that we would just be constantly experiencing the fullness of what you have in store for us as we walk with you and as we give you chances to work in our lives. We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we, as we think about the, the passage that we studied, uh, it may be that as you heard the description of the gospel that Paul proclaimed, it, it may have become clear to you or it may have become a question in your mind that you need to make sure that you know Christ. Uh, it could be that you say, you know what, I've gone to church my whole life, but I don't, I don't know this Lord that Paul experienced. I don't, I don't have a, a story of how God saved me. And I'm not talking about like a, you know, you were a criminal and then you, you weren't. It doesn't have to be like that. But do you have a, a testimony of your faith in Christ? Uh, it could be that, that you are, are certain that you know the Lord, but you aren't walking with him. And you need to repent of that and say, Lord, um, thank you for saving me, but please forgive me for not walking with you. Maybe other things that God has laid on your heart. Maybe you just needed to be reminded that God's in control with something difficult that you're going through. But as we, as we give God an opportunity to continue speaking to us, uh, let's turn to 290. We're going to sing, I am thine, O Lord. 290.